Good morning, everybody. I hope you are full of them, vigor, and vitality. After having a great sleep, I guess, last night, as well as some very good breakfast this morning, I think we need to give our hosts a hand of encouragement on how we have been treated this week. I think it's been quite phenomenal. And uh, this is my first year um, having to have the invitation to come. Uh, even if they don't invite me back next year, I'm going to come and fold the bulletins. Amen. <laughs> hey, this has just been a great. Oh, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you so very much. I really do appreciate it. Um, uh, my my uh, my administrator was uh, involved in this conference in that he was interested in it, and uh, I think he sought to know key people in the conference, and I think that's how they got my name. I think that's how it was, and I did a pre-recording during um, COVID. And then I got an invitation to come this year. I'm so glad to be here, one, because I was being contained, retained because of the virus. And that's not my personality. I, I just, I'm sorry. I got to get out, meet people. I got to rub shoulders with people, bump, you know what I mean, that kind of thing. So, so that being contained, it, it was enough. I know, my, I know, you know, we love our children, we love our wives and all that, but enough is enough. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm like, I need to breathe <laughs> some, some other oxygen. And, and so that, in the midst of all of that, we all had experienced a thing called loss. We lost some things. Um, those of us that are pastors and uh, over ministries and you that are part of parachurch ministries or even in ministries, you have probably seen some loss or heard of some loss or experienced loss in your own life. It could have been personal loss. Members of your family, because of the virus, had been taken home, hopefully knowing Christ, they've been taken home, transitioned, I know for me personally in our church, it was about over 40 deaths that occurred. And I think out of that 40, no less than 35 was COVID related. So it, it uh, I experienced loss at a level that I have never experienced it before as well. And I know it just wasn't me, so I'm probably speaking to some of you in this room doesn't matter how many when it comes to numbers it, it has to do with how the relationship was when they did or when they do experience loss it's still loss and the question that uh, came to mind when 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 C um, uh, CFL or was it CLF CLF came to, 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 to me and asked me could I speak on something pertaining to a passage that they gave me out of First Samuel chapter 30, the chapter out of David's life, and they took a verse out of that, a portion of a verse out of that chapter after David had come back from Ziglag uh, come back to Ziglag and he found that his wife, the men's wives and children, all of that, they experienced loss. Um, and the verse says, for you shall, after David petitioned God, he said, for you shall overtake them and with and with all you shall overtake them without having any all any law. So you shall restore anything that you have lost or that had been taken from you. And the Bible said he did. 
So when we look at this particular passage of scripture, we, 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 we have to really go, go back a couple of chapters to really understand the context of this one chapter um, that, that we come to in the book of Samuel chapter 30. See, all of this fits in a unique framework of providence in the life of David. It's in chapter 28 and chapters prior to that, and we get to this portion of him experiencing loss himself. So he's fleeing from Saul. Y'all remember he got the jittery of jealousy on David. You know, he was the king's man. He was doing what he was commissioned to do, and that was to, to slay the enemy. And the girls came out one day after he came back from battle. Girls came out, and they start singing this hit song that was going around in Israel during that time. It made the top ten list that Saul killed his thousands, but David killed, slayed his ten thousands, woo woo, you know, and and as a result of it, this galvanized an attitude, a spirit of jealousy in Saul, and he misconstrued the whole thing. He, he really thought that David was going to try to take over the kingdom, because after all, if they did that to me, uh, if they sang that about me, I would get the big head if I was under me <laughs> uh, or, or under David. The problem is this, that just because somebody may assume something about you, oftentimes they are not re revealing things about you, they're revealing things about themselves. Whenever anybody gets jealous over you, and the Bible says this, that jealousy or the spirit of jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And what that passage means, those that are infected with an attitude, spirit, you know, disposition of jealousy, what the passage really means is that people want you dead. Now that could be literally six feet under where you are dead and secondly it could mean figuratively when they character assassinate you but in either way they want you dead because you cause a problem for them you think that you are better than anybody else is and when people get infected with the spirit of jealousy my sisters and my brothers you have to realize also that they take out of the equation of God so whenever they take out the equation of God that means this you have gotten where you've gotten to by yourself you have elevated yourself to where you have been elevated to by yourself but they take out the possibility that maybe it was God that elevated the person because they were humble for you know he delights in humility he uh, he resists the proud but he gives grace unto the humble humble yourself in the Greek that's an imperative that says you and I got to do that Humble yourself under the mighty hands of God, and in due season, he'll exalt you. It's one thing I do want to experience in my life, and there's something I don't want to experience in my life. I, I want to always be able to humble myself so that I won't have to be humbled by God. Uh, oh, he has a way of humbling you. As a matter of fact, he has a way of causing confusion in the lives of those who think or who don't believe that they are humble they don't have to be humble is because you ever seen people I know in the church world I've seen people that have gone to school have all kinds of credentials they got more degrees than than that which is on the thermometer I, I mean they, they they they're intelligent they went to the right institutions they have the right lettering behind their names but they can never get 
to a place where they think they deserve to be. And they got all the crudiments to validate that they should be. But they never get there. Because the scripture says that God resists the proud. He puts his finger on them. That's what that verse says. And so you, you you get so confused and get so perplexed. And I got this. I got this. I got this. My resume is this. And I can't get a church or I can't get in a ministry position or I can't. What, what What's going on here? I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah, externally. But you didn't do what you should have done in your internal spiritual formation and that is get low get low get low so that God can exalt you high get high get high God resists the proud and those that have the jittery of jealousy they eliminate any possibility of God doing what he's doing in that person's life they think that they are doing it and how they are doing it they should be able to duplicate it those that are infected with the spirit of jealousy they they should be able to duplicate it because they've taken God out the equation and that's why they think they can get you to that's another sermon for another day but this 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 Saul got jealous over David he has to flee for his life and when he flees for his life, according to chapter 27, he goes to a king uh, that was the king of Philistines or the Philistines named Achish. He goes to him and David says to him, listen, I, I want to serve under you. He took his 600 men. David, you read it when you get a chance in chapter 27. And he makes an allegiance to Achish. Achish also responds to David by David asking and requesting that he would give him a place to stay with he and his men and his fa and their families. He gives them a place called Ziglag. And so as a result of it, he continues to serve under the Philistine king. Now think about this. This is perplexingly paradoxical to me. He goes to a Philistine king that some years earlier, as a boy, he kills Goliath that was a Philistine. And you know in history that um, that story, that historical fact, began to ring throughout the Philistine history. I know that is true because when David joins up with King Achish, when you read in chapter 28 and chapter 29, the, the governors or the princes, according to the translation that you use, that were part of King Achish's army, the Bible says that they said to King Achish when they saw David was marching behind him, and because Achish in the previous chapter had made David his personal bodyguard. And as he made him his personal bodyguard, that said to all those other commanders of certain regions of uh, soldiers, they had a regiment of soldiers, and they said to King Achish, who is this Hebrew? How did he get elevated this fast? Because he stayed with Achish for about a year and four months. That's also in the passage. Uh, that, that amazes me that the scriptures lay out details and if you just follow the details you'll be able to understand how these people may have felt if you were living in their skin and so he, he comes to them and David finds himself in a very dangerous situation when these Philistine commanders or governors uh, or captains, uh, depending on what translation you use, they say to King Achish, listen, we don't feel good about this. 
And King A says, I can vouch for David. He's been this. He's been faithful. He's been loyal. He's protected me. He's always had my back. He showed integrity. He laid out all of this great resume about David. But they said, isn't this the Hebrew that those girls got that top 10 record on <laughs> that said, hey, he saw killed his thousands, but Dave went to another level. He wiped out like 10,000 to, to Saul's thousand. <laughs> Isn't that that dude? And now, here, here, here's the dangerous situation that I want you to see. And in the midst of this dangerous situation, we, we get a divine intervention. It's amazing. It's amazing. So, so here it is. He goes, and they say that about David, and the king responds and said, no, David's this. I got his resume. I know what he's capable of doing. He's proven himself to me. He's a ride-or-die kind of guy. He, 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 he really is. This is my ace boom coon boy to hear. This is my, my ride-or-die guy. I mean, no, no, Dave. He, he, he's good. And they said, now wait a minute, King. Think just a minute. What if we get on the battlefield and Dave's going to come up behind us. You got him covering your back. We're going to be fighting Saul in front of us. And you mean to tell me that David is not going to look at his people or his master Saul? So you got two anointed kings. One of them has been rejected by God. The other one is starting to be accepted by the people as well as accepted by God. And he sees his predecessor, if you would, fighting and they're going to be losing. And you mean to tell me he's not going to flip sides on us? Do you really think that's what David is not going to do? And the king said, he ain't that kind of guy. The truth of the matter is, if that took place, David would have definitely did what David had to do. Because he knew that in spite of how Saul treated him, he still said about Saul, crazy Saul, insane Saul, demented Saul. He had time and times where he could have taken Saul out. He said, I can't touch God's anointed. I can't do it. I, I know he's trying to wipe me out, but I, I, I can't. If he's going to go out, it's not going to be by my hand. Now, you're talking about integrity. You're talking about devotion. You're talking about as, as, as inconsistent as David could be about that kind of thing. He was perpetually consistently making those kinds of judgments and determinations. So here it is. This is where divine intervention comes in. Because David even responded to King Achish and said, what have I done? Have I not shown you? You know, you read this in chapter, I'm going somewhere, just walk with me. Because this makes chapter 30 even more relevant and impactful. He says, then, I, I've done all that I need to do to prove who I am to you. And he says, I know. But because you've been outvoted, Doc, my cabinet overwhelmingly believe that you won't be and continue to be the guy that you have been. So I need you to back up, sit down, slow down. And by the way, you might want to get out of here tonight because I don't know what they're going to do to you. So Dave and his men, they go back, they get back to Ziglag, and when they get back there, that's where I want to start at. They get back there, and when they get back there, so that you can follow me, the first thing that we see is that David had a problem. It was an unexpected problem problem when he got there 
the Amalekites had stripped the city, burned down the other cities around, and they, they had taken their wives, their children, and commodities. In our vernacular, in our day, they've taken their women, their children, their cash, their cars, their creature comforts. They've taken all that away, and David and his men, they come back to what I see in this verse, in this chapter, verses 1 and 2. David came into an unexpected problem. His peeps was gone. His family, their families, they were gone. In the midst of this unexpected problem, we see that these men and David experience some pain. It became a painful situation, which is unex. Uh, un, um, I'm sorry. The, the the pain is is understood. You know, the problem was unexpected, but the pain was understood, and they were grieving, and then this. Pain because of the problem. The, the problem was unexpected. The, the pain was understood. But then we have this predicament that we see David in. And, and that predicament is a result of his men becoming unhinged. They began to look at their situation. They began to look at David's situation, but they were looking at their situation more because here it is. They wanted to stone David. Why would they want to flip all that pain on him? Well, you just remember they got kicked out of a supposed to be war. They didn't were, were not perceived as being trusted in, in this supposed to be war. So they were fighting a war that they weren't supposed to fight. And because they were fighting a war that they weren't supposed to fight, then they get to the place of their homestead where they could have been at a place where they should have been fighting. Therefore, i.e., they get mad at David. So mad they become unhinged that they want to literally stone him. That's his predicament in verse 6 of chapter 30. But look at what David does this time that he did not do previous times. And I'm going to show you that in the midst of them, him being this predicament, look at what David does. David pauses and he doesn't respond, which shows us it affected his posture his resolve and if you would go back to chapter 27 and in verse number 27 I mean sorry verse number 1 of chapter 27 it says this according to the Christian home and translation of holy writ it says this David said to himself about Paul chase, Saul chasing him and he went on to talk about what he said to himself the author says here in chapter 39, I mean 27, 28, 29, you never hear David, or it does not say that David consulted God about anything. He did what he did by consulting himself. His own rationale. His own abilities, his own strengths. But then when we get to chapter 30, he gets into another predicament. But this time his man, his men are thinking about offing him, putting a contract out on David. His own inside crew, if you would. Putting a contract on David and the Bible says... According to verse, the B section of verse number six, the Bible said that when they were in that position and the troops was talking about stoning him, the Bible says that, but David, he strengthened, encouraged, depending on translation, himself 
in the Lord. David said <laughs> to Amathar, Amathar, hey, go get the ephod. I don't have nothing to say about this. I don't think any way about this. I need to know the heart and the mind of God about this for it to be in what I'm experiencing at this time in my life. If you, if I, if we are going to experience any form of restoration, any form of restoring, I think the first thing that has to be affected and the first thing we have to do is deal with our own spiritual formation as leaders and as pastors. The issue here is from the top up, top down, not from the bottom up. If you and I are going to receive any form of restoration, I think we've got to be concerned about our spiritual formation on how we move forward from here. David never consulted the Lord about the other situations that he was in. But let me tell you here, this corona situation is unexpected. Hello, somebody. It was definitely unexpected. And the pain that it caused by all of the deaths that we experienced around us was understood. And if you don't watch it, this pandemic can make you become unhinged. I know preachers and pastors during these past two years have called me and said to me, number one, I can't do this no more. Two was, I can't do this this way no more. They have gotten on. It was something that they were not familiar with in the form of doing worship have in church totally different <laughs> excuse me <clears throat> totally contrary and unfamiliar in the way that we do ministry and that can be frustrating that can be perplexing that can be confusing and then people still keep dying that's loss my sisters and my brothers. That's a whole lot of loss. That's a whole lot of pain. And I believe that we have not experienced the consequences of it, the residue of it. We're getting it slowly, it's coming in, but we have been damaged. No one in this room have ever lived through a pandemic. That happened in the early 1900s. That was the last one. This is the first one in our lifetime that we've ever experienced a pandemic. And back then, 120,000 died. Now, this, the last count, you know, back then uh, when it was going on, it was over 800,000 people that died. No one has ever experienced anything like that. So it's understood that we should have pain. And there are times that we can become unhinged. I've had pastors say, man, you know, I, I, can't, I, I, I can't even do church like that. And see, in the African-American community, we live off of, or we have been known for centuries, centuries, we live off a of call and response, meaning that preaching is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue between the pulpit and the pew. So, so as a result of it, after we make a point, See, even some of y'all have been doing that while, while I've been, you know, trying to deal with this. And that lets me know I can go to my next point. You got it. You know, you now, for me, 40 years of pastor sharing, and, and, and now I'm going to a 3500 seat sanctuary, and I'm looking into some cameras, and nobody's there for over 18 months, almost two years, nobody. I had to get accustomed. 
and, and, and I said, well, maybe if I do it from home, I feel better. When I did it from home one time, it just didn't feel churchy. <laughs> you know, I, I just didn't, I don't know, it just didn't feel right to me. I, I, I had to go into the literal building. And I did that, too, to give the people some sense of familiarity, you know, and norm normacy and, and that kind of sense. But it took me about three months just to get used to talking in the camera and nobody give me immediate confirmation or affirmation on what I'm saying mm -hmm. and what I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. Took about three months. And I tell you, my sisters and my brothers, I'm, I'm not afraid to say this, it wore me out. I mean, literally. When I got finished, I used to do two services like that every Sunday. When I got finished with that one service, I went across to the other side of the church took a shower, put on some, you know, sweats. Before I went home, I laid down and went to bed. That's how exhausted and drained I was on one surface. It, 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 it's like you feel it coming out of you, but you feel like you don't get no deposits coming back to you. So, I mean, this, you know, has caused a lot of us to become unhinged. And as a result of it, we find ourselves making premature decisions about what we can't do because of so much loss. And so I've had pastors had to talk them down off the bridge, if you would. Hey, wait a minute, man. Uh, you got to build, you know, your social media platform up, you know, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, streaming, and a lot of churches weren't doing that pre-COVID, so that really threw them off. Some of us that were doing it, we, we, we was like around the curve a little bit. We had a curve on the situation, but those that weren't doing that pre-COVID, that's why it wiped out a lot of churches, a lot of pastors said they, they just not coming back no more. They've shut churches down. Sale sign on the building. I mean, just became unhinged about so much pain and the predicament that it had placed us in. And then David's posture was this time, I'm going to talk to God about this. What do you say I ought to do? How do you say I ought to proceed? So to stop you as a leader from becoming unhinged, you, we have to remind ourselves that God said to us, if any man lack wisdom when they're going through tribulation, Talk to me. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God so that he will give you what you need based on this situation that you're going through, insight, foresight, what you're going through so that he can get you through it. Talk, James says, draw nigh to me and I will draw near to you. Jeremiah says, call upon me. And I'll answer and show you great and mighty things that you don't know of. So when we find ourselves in a predicament that has caused pain so that you and I won't change our posture, pause, and as my grandma would say, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your trouble. He'll hear your humble cry. He'll answer by and by. Feel a little prayer wheel turning. Feel a little fire burning. Have a little talk with Jesus. He'll make things all right. The, what David did in the midst of his loss is that he paused. He was firm on his posture about not moving without getting some kind of answer from God. He was unmoved 
even though his men became unhinged and he was literally not only was David unmoved God had given him a prescription for his problem after he made his petition he said to the Lord hey can I go get these jokers? No, no, he didn't say that. He didn't, he, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That, and, 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 and that's my Philly street side coming out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He, he, he said, he said, he asked God, he asked the Lord, he said, shall I pursue these raiders? Not only shall I pursue them, but uh, will I overtake them? See, David knew that you can pursue anybody you want to pursue, but that doesn't mean your outcome will be favorable. So David wanted to double check. He says, now can I go get them? And then will I be able to swoop and whoop them up a little bit? And, and, and the Lord said, yeah, you can go on and get them. And not only go ahead and get them, because I'm going to be with you this time. You, you, you're consulting me now. You're talking to me now and not as you're not acting as if you've gotten spiritual amnesia and you've forgotten who've gotten you to this point. But but OK, I got you, Dave. This is restoration for you as well. All right. I, I'm going to give you restoration in your soul, in our fellowship together. Uh, now, I want you to know that you can also get restoration from the things that they took from you because you won't lose anything. And, and, and the Bible says because of his petition, God gave him a prescription which gave him a purpose and his purpose was to go back and get what you lost. He became, if you would, undefeated. God gave him back everything that he lost. Now, application, now wait a minute, Bishop, you can't say that we're going to get everything back that we lost. We lost a lot of people. You can never get them back. But this is what God will do. he gives give you some new people. That's a form of getting back what you lost. There's some more lost souls out there. And they need to be found. And we need to be the conduit of winning lost people. I think one of the things that the pandemic has done, I know that it's not for me, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure that it's not just me, but one of the things that it's done is that sometimes if you've been pastored in a certain at the time, a certain group of people, you, you almost, it's a subconscious thing. It's not something that you do consciously, but subconsciously you almost forget about lost people because you got all these found people that were lost, but now they're found. And watch this, they're developed spiritually. They're more mature. They, they function with you better. You don't have a lot of conflicts. I mean, you have some, but it's not the way it used to be when you first started. And then having that kind of atmosphere, you kind of kind of get a little comfortable on even considering lost people. So maybe what God does and what he did via this uh, pandemic, at least he took found people home with him in your centric circle of contact. And not that they were lost people because he wasn't taking them with him. So the comfort comes in that at least they were saved. Now, yes, the, the, the hurt, the confusion, the perplexity, um, going through the process of grief that, that none of us are exempt from, from the pulpit to the door. All of us have to go through the process of grief, shock, you know what I mean, not believing it, the point of then you grieve, then you, you know, go through the period of depression, go through a period of anger, and all the phases and stages of grief we too had to go through. After you get through that, what then? You learn to live on. 
you learn to recover. And then you're going to live your life according to the way that God has planned your life to be. So I think what it did for a lot of us, it really awakened us to how lost this world is and how people are lost. And the church is not an institution, it's an organism, a living organism. And it makes us aware that our mission in life is not just to remain as we are, to be comfortable what we have obtained, to learn to live comfortably without any challenge, without any passion for those that don't know him because there was a time that we were where they are. I think sometimes we get saved too long. That's what I call it. We be saved too long because then we forget about how we used to be. And we even forget about that we even had to come to Jesus because we've been this way so long in Jesus. <laughs> that I don't even remember me not, not never being unsaved. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. We get delusional in our thinking. You know what I mean? I've always walked with the Lord all of my life. You know what I mean? I've been saved, sanctified, filled, fire baptized, run to see what the end going to be like all of my life. <laughs> I was born on the third pew of the church. Don't y'all know that? <laughs> you know? Not so, not so, not so, not so. So I, I think in the replacement and restoration of the loss that we experience with people, get new people, unsaved that have never either heard the gospel or haven't heard it clearly or don't know what to do with it after they hear it. When lost people. Matthew 28 says something so phenomenal and we use it in the, and on the Baptist church as a serum for the uh, ceremony of baptism where Jesus says, Go ye therefore to all the world, make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The, there's only one imperative in that verse, and uh, I think one of the speakers this week had pointed that out, I think, when I went in this classroom. There's one imperative in the verse, and the imperative is make disciples. And you know how to make disciples, and then it gives you the objectives on how to do it. Go! Baptize and teach. Those are the three objectives to, to fulfill the one imperative. And that is make disciples. How did I do that? Go. Evangelize. Get out there. Go win folk to Christ. And we did an evaluation one time in our ministry of how many going ministries do we have and how many staying ministries do we have. And um, at one time it was a little lopsided. We had a lot of staying ministries where we equipped people that have become found and you know a lot of staying ministries that we had in our church and we were lopsided on the going side of ministries but how do you make disciples by going evangelizing lost people and, and what we the reason why we don't win a lot of lost people because a lot of us have forgotten how lost we were and we become unsympathetic to the lives that they live. We look at them like, mm. oh, you're in a bad way. So were you how many years ago? You didn't come to Christ pristine. You know, you, 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 may, it e you may have even had sophistication about your sin, but nonetheless, it's still sin. You know, you, you would never commit fornication in the back of a car in the park in the dark. So you go in a hotel. 
and commit fornication. Y'all not talking back to. You would never drink your liquor or your wine out of the bottle, turning it up to your head. You drunk yours out of a flute or uh, out of a glass. <laughs> you still got drunk. <laughs> you drunker. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? You would never steal nothing from a nickel and dime penny store, five and dime kind of penny store. You you went to Macy's. You're still a thief. <laughs> it doesn't matter what qualitative or how you think about it qualitatively. You still was that. Whatever it was, you were that. And we forget that so we don't have a passion or a sensitivity toward those that are not like us. Go. Then he says to us to restore. Baptize, that word baptizo in the Greek, it has two definitions depending on the context on how the word is used. It has a etymological meaning and a theological meaning. A etymological meaning is that it has to do with water and you are getting in water. It's the same word that's used when Philip came up to the Ethiopian and shared with him the gospel out of Isaiah 53 and interpreted, interpreted it for him. And the Bible says, he says, what hinders me from being baptizo? Saint, that, and that's the etymological meaning. You're getting in the water and you're baptizing. So the context determines what the word means. The theological meaning this, it's not a wet truth, it's a dry truth. It speaks about identification. So in Matthew 28, it really is not a serum for baptism the way we baptize people. We can use that, but it's limiting it because it's not just talking about water baptism there, it's talking about identifying people with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit, and how do we do that? Teaching them, Lord have mercy. If you keep that verse in its context and let it speak to you, it really does have, in that context, it has nothing to do with water, because water is not in that context at all. But it's not a cardinal sin for you to baptize people in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. And then you go to the Acts, most of the time they baptize people in the name of Jesus. So now you're going to make a conflict out of the mode of baptism. Stop. We're majoring in the minors and not majoring in the majors. And the major is make disciples. How do I do that? By going by identifying them that you have gotten with the Father, with the Son, with the Holy Spirit. And how do I identify them? By teaching them to observe all those things that I've told you about the Father, about the Son, about the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The word is ego I me. He says, I will be with you. That word ego, I mean, means I, even I. Meaning that if God gets a church, gets a ministry, one of his ecclesias locally, if he gets you to buy in on his program about making disciples, about um, identifying them with the Father by teaching them to observe, if he gets a group of people that gets that program from him, the Great Commission from him, Jesus says, the Father ain't going to be there. I ain't even going to send the Spirit to be there. I'm going to show up on that one. I'm going to be with you on that program, on that plan. And I think that will be the plan. That is the plan. That has always been the plan for restoration to take place in each of our ministries, in each of our churches. I'm done. I got some more, but got some more. I don't know. I, 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 I got more truth than I got time. <laughs> so, so I'm going to... Uh, 
at this time maybe open it up. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was encouraging to you and for you. I'm going to open up for some questions that you might have. Yes, sir, my brother. Yes, sir. Or our reduced service right. online. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I, I think, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't know if yeah, I did. Really did that, that. Yeah. And, and again, mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, I think a lot of it is, it's, it's facts that's propagating apprehension or fear. But, it's, 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 it's to know the difference between functioning out of fear and being motivated by wisdom. A lot of our fear comes out of a lack of wisdom in responding to what we are experiencing. And again, the facts are people are dying. You understand? Uh, they, they are dying. But, but, but the other fact of that is, are y'all wearing masks? Mm. Have y'all taken the vaccination or, you know, or that kind of thing? And then there became a misnomer about the vaccinations. Mm. That caused fear. Oh, you're not going to take that. They're marking us. They, you know, it's the mark of the beast. And, you know, it has different things. And that operates on different people different ways. You know, they're planting a chip in you. Oh, come on, stop. Uh, but my point is, there is a number, a small number, that where the vaccination will have adverse effects. That's a smaller number than the larger number that it works for. So you've got to walk in wisdom and not just in fear. You know, if we do our part, I promise you, God do his part. He, he, he gonna do his part. And, and, don't, and another misnomer that we have is that we, uh, I'm talking about the Christian community, we have this misnomer that God's gonna do it all without any joint responsibility from humanity. Uh, no, he always works in concert with humanity. If you go through the Gospels and you'll find that any miracle that he did, it was in concert with the people in which he was doing it to or he gave them some responsibility as a result of it or uh, as, as, a, as a responsibility at the end of it. When it came to Lazarus, when he was buried, uh, you know, and Jesus said, all right, take me where you, where you laid him at. And, and the Bible said when they got there, he told them, roll away the stone. Could he have not just swiped his hand? And John was you know why he told them to roll away the stone? Because they were the ones that put the stone over it. <laughs> uh, duh. On our deep, I'm heavy in. <laughs> no, no, but I'm just saying. They rolled the stone on it. So here's the other pr principle. He will never ask you to do what you can't do. He will only ask you to do what you can do. And then he will do what only he can do. Then and not only that, but after he called them, from, gave them recitation, came out of the tomb, He's wrapped in dead men's clothes or go, uh, garments that they used back then when they wrapped dead people. He said to them, take off the clothes. Why do you think he told them to take off the clothes? They put on the clothes. <laughs> Come on here. 
So, so he was simply saying, I think the principle that John was making too is that whenever God wants to perform, and John used the word sign, he doesn't use the word miracle, because John was saying what Jesus did was pointing somewhere, was taking us somewhere. So John said when he did that sign, the reason why he did that sign because he wanted them to know, number one, if you have anything to do with it becoming dysfunctional, you will have to do something with it to cause it to cause it to become functional. So if you put the clothes on them, you rolled away the stone. Well, you can roll away the stone. You can put, you know, take away the stone, and you can go in there. And when I call them out, I can only call them out. I'm not going to even ask you to do that because that's beyond your human ability and capacity. But what is in your reach is that if you put those wrappings on him, you need to take those wrappings off of him. And so I think the, the, the print, one of the principles are that when he does a sign, when he does a miracle, you're going to play a part in it. You're going to have some human responsibility. He's not going to do it all because that alleviates us from having any responsibility and what he when he healed the man that was on the pallet for 38 years the man got up walked away he said hey pick that pallet up and take it with you could have made a carpet out of it a magic carpet and said sit on it and go around Jerusalem and sh tell everybody what I've done to you no he said pick that pallet up you because it was a reminder to him where he came from and it's a reminder of him who did it. And he had to go back to it. Every time when he healed the mountain, guy with the spit on the ground, put the clay on his head, he said, now you go wash yourself. I ain't washing it. <laughs> I just put it on you. <laughs> I just gave you who I am because it's a lot. I'm going to talk about that's another sermon for another day. That's how they know his DNA today. Now take that. I'm, I'm giving this one free. The next one going to cost y'all preachers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. The saliva that Jesus spit in the ground was his DNA. It's who he was. How do they determine our DNA? By spitting in something, by swabbing us. They can tell you who, what blood type this was, who this person was, what's the genetic order of the individual, all that. Well, whatever Jesus was, when he spit in that clay, he put it on his eyes. That's what that man became. He experienced a part of Christ's life, his power, who he was, what he was in his DNA. Because he did become flesh and dwelled among us. And my time is up. Oh, man, I really enjoyed this group right here. Y'all are something else such a blessing thank you so 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 very much i got a half a second